So here we are talking to Stu McGill, and he's going to kind of explain his interview process is how he uncovers what what's going on in his patients, um, their their life, and it has a real calculated way of of uncovering what's going on in somebody's life to, to what's causing their problems. So Stu, how do you, how do you do that? Well, it may give uh, some help to explain the pathway to this. I was trained as a scientist, not as a clinician. So I was trained on how to probe and investigate phenomena so I could understand them. When we started the clinic at the university, I didn't have to follow a traditional model of any clinical art. And uh, so we started that by setting aside sufficient time for the interview process. And we would take patients uh, to an area where they sat in front of a fireplace to get them to relax and create an atmosphere for them to tell me what they've never told another clinician before. They're used to going to a clinician and getting three minutes and they see the top of the head of the clinician as someone's writing down a few notes, if they're lucky. Uh, so uh, I, I had studied the techniques of uh, interrogation and, uh, but again, it, w it wasn't from a medical background. It was to extract information. I need to know from that patient why they hadn't succeeded in the past. What were the impediments? Uh, what was their social situation that was impeding their progress? Did they have to keep proving to the person who was paying their disability that yes, they're truly uh, disabled? And uh, see, all of these things are, are very important modulators of uh, how I need to get through to that person to uh, create a plan that's going to uh, deal with, with, with their back pain. But I also did a lot of other things that will surprise people. I had a patient years ago who had won the Las Vegas uh, Poker Stars competition or whatever the name of that is, won, won several million dollars. And uh, I said, I'll make you a deal. I'll tell you what I know about your back pain, but I need you to teach me how you know what the cards are that they're holding. What are you reading in their body? And so I, I used to take uh, many opportunities like that. You have to be able to read a person and you don't learn this in traditional training. What is it in their eyes? The depth of their breathing, how they're sitting, uh, that uh, is revealing to me whether they are exaggerating, truthful, emotional, what their cards are, in other words. So uh, I have to keep creating an atmosphere and probing and perturbing that situation to get to, a, to, to extract information from them. So I know when we go downstairs, what do I need to further probe uh, physically to recreate their pain? So I'm very sure of what the pain mechanism is. And then we proceed after that to eliminate all the other uh, possible candidates. But this room is set up very specifically for that. Uh, the couch is built of the highest density foam known. When I had the couches made, the manufacturer said, you won't like this, you're going to send it back to us. Uh, are you? And I said, no, I know what I'm doing. Please make the couches like this. And they're, they're very firm, as you know, and there's a little bit of uh, a back support behind that if you grab the bulb there you can tune the amount of hydraulic support it's it's actually pneumatic mm -hmm. behind your back and and i get them to relax and shape that and show them uh that that they can actually change the intensity of their pain some of the time by uh, uh posturing their back a certain way and migrating the stress I've already begun to get their buy-in now. They're already starting to feel a little bit more empowered and in control. So this is all part of the uh, process of understanding why they're in pain. Well, it's very disarming to have you know, the comfortable couch, the fire, the beautiful landscape in back, the dog. Um, just, you know, just it is relaxing, and I can see I can see where the patients feel more not vulnerable, but more able to just free themselves to tell you what's going on. Right. And there's no rush to this either. I and no take white the jacket. Time. Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. And I'm play acting all the time. Uh, when uh, I, I teach this in a course situation, I will play act with uh, clinicians who come in. And sometimes I'll be very, very quiet and empathetic. 
And uh, the next moment I turn around with the next patient and I'm, I'm a little rough on them, a little hard on them, giving them a reality check of how it is their slothful behavior, perhaps, that is leading to their uh, back pain, the the, the lifestyle that they're leading, I might shock them and say, you know, you deserve your pain, you're causing it, but here is why, and here's what we're, we're, I can show you that uh, we, we, you can do to yourself to uh, pull you out of this, this crime. You, you have to incident. find out whether they're willing to make changes, in, the changes required to get over their back pain. Uh, in, in the most simplistic description, yes. Wonderful. This is very disarming, as I said, very comfortable. And you'll spend three hours with them. So what kind of questions do you ask them? Well, uh, uh, when they come here, I welcome them. I say, welcome to Gravenhurst. Uh, as you're aware, I've retired from the university. So welcome to my home. And that in of itself is uh, disarming to uh, some of them. And then I'll say, tell me why you're here. Tell me your story. That's it. Now, I've given them free reign. They might immediately tell me, oh, well, my pain is an eight, and, and you know, they have to prove to me that they have pain. And, and that tells me a little bit of their past experience and what they're expecting of me. Um, someone else might not even mention their pain. They might tell me the pressures of their job and how they have to continue to support their five kids uh, at home or whatever their social pressures are, that I have to understand what is driving their, their current behavior that is not working to get rid of their pain. And I just let them talk. And some of them tell me all about their pain. Uh, oh, it's in here. Uh, when I drive or sit at the computer for 20 minutes, I get back pain and then my right toe goes on fire. But if I go out for a walk, the pain goes away. Fabulous. They've, they've pretty much told me what the pain mechanism is. I just have to go downstairs and prove it in the clinic. And then there are other people who don't say too much. And I'll just gently start my questions. And I call them the million dollar questions. And I might start out with one that is incredibly uh, insightful. Do you have good and bad days? And they'll, they'll think about it and they'll say, well, yes, I have better and worse days. Uh, would you be happy if every day was as good as your good day? And they'll say yes. And I said, good, we won't fail with you. You've just proven you have the ability to have a good day. There's always a cause. Let's discover why you have good days and let's discover what is causing the bad days. We'll eliminate some of those factors, build on the success and make sure every day is a good day. And we'll wind down your pain and you'll see their face change. Yes, I have good days. I have that ability. I get you. It's logical. So I'm, I'm working on a buy-in as, as we proceed through. And then as I peel the layers, I might ask a question like, when you roll over in bed, do you ever get a sharp pain? Now that is a fabulous question to determine if they have joint micro movements and laxities that will trigger sharp uh, pains. And then a follow-up question, if that's affirmative, might be something like, how many pillows do you go to bed with at night? And the more the pillows, the more joint instability they have. It, it, it is incredible, the, the correlations that uh, are associated with uh, uh, some of these questions. And then uh, I get to, to some more behavioral habits. What time do you get up in the morning? And someone who tells me they lay in bed because of their back pain, and then I go downstairs and measure that the discs swell through the night, as you know, through the osmotic gradient that if they actually spent less time in bed, they would have less back pain. Uh, we've uh, done several experiments to uh, prove that. Then I get into activities, very specific activities that exacerbate the pain and others that might take the pain away. Oh, when I go walking with my spouse at the, at the shopping mall, that's terrible. I get back pain, but that's static load. How about if we walk fast around the block? Would that cause your pain? No, that's relieving of my pain. Aha, same activity, different dose. One is, is therapeutic, the other is a cause of your pain. Then we get into the nature of the pain. Tell me about your day. When you wake up in the morning, do you have morning stiffness and a lot of pain or is that the best time of your day? If they say, oh no, that's really my worst time, we then follow up. Tell me about your mattress. Have you ever slept at a friend's house or in a hotel? Did you notice your back pain was different in the morning, etc. 
Then I get into uh, describe the pain for me. Uh, you've mentioned that when you sit at your computer, your right toe goes to sleep. Is it a numb it pain, numbness? Is it a burning? Is it a shooting pain? When the pain patterns grow, do they follow the same pathway? So the pain might start in your back, and then it goes to your right buttock, and then it goes to the outside of your right knee, and then when the pain diminishes, it follows a centralization of exactly the same path. Or is your pain, in the morning it's on the right side, and then in the afternoon I do something, and then it shifts and it goes down my left leg. They've just shown me, once again, that there's something changing in their back. They have micro movements or instabilities that things are shifting and picking up different pain triggers, or they might have multiple mechanisms of pain as well. So I keep peeling the onion with very targeted questions. So by the time we finish the interview, I know a fair amount about their personality. I know a lot about their learning style. I, I can give you an example of that. Have you ever known an explosive athlete? So a sprinter, an MMA fighter, someone who just can explode, but then they don't have much endurance. Have you ever met one who doesn't have what's been labeled as attention deficit disorder? I'm sorry. <laughs> so it, it, right. it, it, it is a syndrome associated with the neurology of being fast and explosive. You're not patient and you have 30 seconds to interact with that athlete and then they're lost. Their, their brain is off on something else. So I'm already gauging how I'm going to coach them, uh, what their learning style is. And someone else, they might be highly intelligent. Uh, they might have an engineering background. Okay, I'm going to use an example from there, I have time to develop the logic, and at the end, they'll say, you know, I've never had that explained to me. Thank you for not treating me like a five-year-old. Everyone else I've ever acted with has treated me like a five-year-old. Or the next person is a car mechanic, and I explain to them, well, if you have a problem undoing a, a, a rusted bolt on a car, you get a cheater bar, a Johnson bar, a longer bar, you create a longer lever arm, but that's what you're doing every time you pull on a cable in the gym doing a pal-off press way out here, whereas that is what is actually triggering the, uh, the pain sensitivity. So I can use their language, or it doesn't matter if they're a finance person, I'll say, you're bankrupt. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? And I said, all day long, you steal a dollar out of your bank account. You're bankrupt. You have no money to train with or do things pain-free. However, if throughout the day you moved in a way that respected your pain trigger, Every time you moved, you will put a dollar in your bank. Now you'll have $20 at the end of the day to go and do the thing you love with pain-free. So I'll, I'll try and figure out the person, read them, and interact with them in a way that they understand. And uh, as I said, I will switch from tough love and being not a very nice person right through to being the most gentle, quiet, soft, slow, empathetic, you know, some people just need a hug. The next person needs a on the side of the head. So anyway, it's the full spectrum and I'm, I'm trying to figure it all out here and, and how we're going to be the person who changes their life. So you, you said you had somebody may come in, they've got, they're trying to prove their disability to the person who's paying their paycheck. Those are the frustrating ones to me, the veterans, the veterans affairs that write people checks for being disabled and they come in to for treatment, to make them better, it costs them money. So you actually have those patients show up here as well? Absolutely or? I do, yes. There are some insurance companies who pay them to come. That's a, that's a different game. Yes. And uh, I have to break them down a little bit. And I have to say, what do you want from life? Now, you can be disabled and stay the way you are and behave the way you are, and you'll guarantee you will stay the way you are. I hope you love your life. But if you want to consider something different, I can guide you. But if you don't, uh, I hope you enjoy your life. You're free to go. And that's shocking to them. So I, I, with those, I have to shock a little bit. And I'll say, uh, do you have everything you want in life monetarily? And, you, and, and if, if you don't and you need the money and what you're currently doing is getting you that thing, great, stay the way you are. But if you, if you want to play with your grandchildren and do, uh, you know, write, put a number beside it. What's more important? What's the, what's most important? 
and you decide and tell me, and I'll tell you what I know. So it's, it's, they've never had people talk to them like this before. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm retired. I don't need to do this. I, I've never needed to do this. I, I've always been a university professor. So uh, I, I, I do what's required. And uh, I, I don't have allegiance to any uh, school uh, and, and even, well, I mean, I, I don't know what more I can say. It's a matter of reading people. And uh, think of being a parent, Bill, and I know you're, you're a parent of, of four terrific kids. You, at times, have had to treat them all a little bit differently for the circumstance at the time and what it required to guide them as best you could as a dad. Isn't that what we do as clinicians? It is. I remember once at, talking to a patient who kept, you know, a new patient sliding the disability papers towards me. And I asked what she wanted. Signed the disability papers. And I finally said, if I had a magic wand and could do anything, sign the disability papers. So the thought of me waving the magic wand and saying you're cured never crossed her mind. Um, that that was her motivation. Her, the, what she wanted was not to get better. She wanted the money. So didn't accept her as a patient because I don't specialize in that. The frustrating, but it's... It may be that she wanted more money as well because of the opioids that mm -hmm. she'd been addicted to by people who prescribed those to her because they were beyond the scope of their expertise. Boy, that's a why statement. That's true. It's, it's most, most of the abuses and the excessiveness, the excessive use of of, of uh, diagnostic technology is not done by the people who know what they're doing. It's done by the people who don't know what they're doing. The, the first line, the people who had the least training in treating spine conditions are the ones who are more apt to re who give the opiates or to get, put the request in for an MRI. I had a, a, uh, a doctor, a, a physical medicine doctor, spend a day with me at the hospital foreshadowing me. At the end of the day, he said, you know, I kind of wish I didn't have prescription privileges. I spend half my day arguing with my patients about their pain meds. Where you don't even have that conversation. You just you're trying to find out what's wrong with them and, and correct it. Anyway, well, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing this. For sharing the day with us. Um, I'm so relaxed right now. I want to tell you everything is <laughs> everything is going on. This is a very effective place to interview people and so relaxing and so warm and healing. And uh, thank you so much for having us here. Well, as I said before, Bill, thanks for all of uh, your support of our work over the years. And uh, I think of two times that uh, I've reached out to you and asked you to do something for me and you did it. And I thank you so much. Well, You're a good you, friend. Brad. And thank you for all of uh, our interactions well, over the years. Thank you so much. They've been fabulous.